sun is shining here and I, I couldn't be happier about that. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce to you uh, Garfield Ginny Newman, who is an associate professor in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning at OISE, University of Toronto. He explores how to teach through sustained critical inquiry while nurturing deep conceptual on understanding and genuine competence. Garfield has worked with thousands of teachers across grades and subjects, helping them to frame learning around engaging and provocative activities and rich, authentic assessments. Currently, Garfield is engaged with schools across Canada, in South America, and in Europe. Over the past two decades, requests for Garfield services have taken him from Asia to the Middle East, Europe, the Caribbean, and across North America. His interest in effective teaching and learning has led him to actively explore the challenges and opportunities presented by teaching and learning in the digital age. In addition to his work at the University of Toronto and delivering workshops, Garfield has also authored several articles, chapters in books, and seven textbooks, and has taught in the faculties of education at York University and the University of British Columbia. His most recent book, co-authored with Roland Case, Creating Thinking Classrooms, has received widespread praise from leading educators across Canada and internationally. So um, I will turn it over to you in just a moment, Garfield. Um, if people have questions during the course of uh, the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat um, and I will uh, forward them on to Garfield. Let's go. Great. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. Um, it'd be great just as I start to uh, get started. If you could in the chat, just let me know where you're coming to us from and uh, what grade level or subjects that you teach. It'd be really helpful if I, I know uh, where you're located and what you're teaching. And then some of the comments can kind of be tailored to that. And and just a, a quick thought before we, we jump into this, you know, Vanessa mentioned uh, you know, my interest in working with, with schools internationally and and trying to find authentic ways. And I just launched, um, now this is for, for uh, grade ones to four, but I, I want to tell you a, a parallel. We just launched a global inquiry into fall and we have children grades one to four exploring how similar or different is fall where they live from other parts of the world. And we have children from China, Korea, uh, Krakow, uh, Prague, Uganda, Peru, um, Mexico, Iqaluit, Alberta, Manitoba, and Ontario participating. Anyway, the reason I'm telling because I know you're, you're, many of you are, you are older grades, I've had some interest and just love to know if some of you might, we were putting together, looking at putting together a, a global inquiry into climate change. And, and the idea would be to bring young people together through Google Slides where they can add to, through some Zoom calls, just to talk about you know, take a picture of your backyard. How is climate change impacting? What, what is your government doing? What are you doing locally? And learn from each other. So um, this is just an opportunity for me to say, hey, anyone interested in possibly joining, if I can get that put together and, and get going, just uh, be great to know if anyone's interested in, in taking part. Anyway, thanks for, for letting me know where we've got an interesting range here from, I was just in Winnipeg all this week. Um, so that was lovely. So I see people there from Ontario. Uh, Eleanor, pretty close. I'm in Caledon East, so not, not too far away from, from you. Um, even closer, I guess, to, to Sherry. So welcome. We're going to get started because we only have an hour, and um, I'm just going to share my screen to get us started. So Vanessa, can you just give me the thumbs up that you can see my screen? Perfect. Thank you. I, I, I want just to quickly touch on, I, I teach a graduate course at OISE in assessment, and a couple of years ago, I reframed it around, around this visual that, that when assessment is used effectively, it should do these three things. It, it should inspire learning, inform learning, and sustain learning. Which of those three do you think my students fairly routinely are surprised or puzzled by? Which of those ones do you think they, they typically say, yeah, I wouldn't have connected that to assessment? You want to take a stab at which one is fairly commonly surprises my students. Yeah, uh, Vanessa, you're right. It, 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 every time it, my students say, 
I really wouldn't have connected it uh, to it. So, and I have to, I, that's a concern for me that, that, uh, that our students often feel like assessments are, you know, anxiety creating. Uh, when I showed my son who, who's 30, but I asked him about, you know, when you were in school, like, what, what do you think of these? He said, I never would have connected Inspire. He said, maybe Perspire, but not Inspire. Uh, so I wanted to, in, in part, say, well, how, how, do we, how do we shift that? And taking a look at, you know, and I wanted to show you, because notice the, you know, the primary purpose of assessment, and, and this is from across Canada. I just pulled, um, you know, the Galileo Project in Alberta is to improve student learning, uh, growing success in Ontario. The primary purpose is to improve student learning. Uh, the Man in Manitoba education, the primary role is to enhance teaching and improve student learning. You might notice in all of those to inspire learning is missing. It, it's, it's about measuring uh, learning. And I want to suggest to you, and this is the little tweak I want to offer, is I want to argue that the primary purpose of assessment is actually to cultivate uh, learner agency. That I think it's more than just measure curricular outcomes. I think it's to, to nurture agency. And this visual is to remind us agency has to involve more than voice and choice. It, it's not a matter of just saying what would you like to learn. Your voice is disappearing. Garfield. What is interesting? Garfield. We're having some tech. Nicole, uh, technical difficulties. I mean, Garfield. I have two concerns with that. One is um, voice is disappearing. Okay, yes, that's let correct. me. Um, yeah. Garfield, if you turn off your camera, Stop that might video. help the internet connection. Exactly. Does that help? Right? Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Sorry, everyone. I just hope that's not a harbinger of a shutdown happening, but we'll see. Um, so keep me posted I'll, 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 if I need to back up. So I was saying a few years ago, five years ago, or so I did a TED talk actually in Waterloo uh, on inspiring on wonder in education, that, that I think the role of teachers is not just to say to kids, what do you want to learn? It's actually to excite kids to want to learn about things they never knew they had an interest in. Um, I can tell you, you know, my bucket list grew because of courses I took with teachers who inspired me to want to travel somewhere, to want to learn more about an artist. Can anyone in the chat post, did, has anyone um, been inspired? Like what's on your bucket list of travel that was inspired by a course you took, whether in your undergraduate, high school, did anyone have like, you know, because I took this course, oh, I so wanted to go wherever. What, what would, would that be? Or did you have other things that were inspired? Anyway, as you're doing that, I mean, that's the will part of agency. Is, is, and part of our job, I think, is, oh, interesting. So getting the gas on world issues. Oh, Viking history, that's a cool one. Okay, getting to France. See, th this is confirming what I'm saying is I think, um, you know, how many of us have been inspired? Like think of the role that, that we play in, 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 the, in the humanities of just inspiring kids I want to know more. I want to get there. I'll tell you one for me. Uh, I did a, a course in classical art and architecture, and I, I just wanted to get to Knossos to see, uh, I want to get to Crete to see Knossos and, and Festos, which we did a few years ago. Um, anyway, uh, that's the will part. But the other part of agency is building the capacity to do the learning. Because you see, the danger is if I, if I inspire kids, oh, I'd like to learn, but I don't give you the tools to learn. We see kids often get excited about, or we give them choice. They get to learn about what they want. Okay. But then they don't know how to select sources. They don't know how to make good notes. They don't know how to read for depth. If I don't build your capacity to think, giving you the choice only gets me part way. So uh, I'm, I want to argue that the real purpose of assessment is to empower kids through agency to be excited to learn and to know how to do that learning. So that's that's kind of what I how I want to frame um, what I want to look at. And, and I want to just touch on you know assessments that inspire. Uh, and one of the things that has you know that I have to think about is this idea of, of like let's think about learning as real, real. And what I mean by that is so I have two dimensions to authentic learning because you know lots of stuff's written around authentic learning. I think lots of us look at how can we do things that are authentic in our class. So Vanessa and I were chatting earlier and you're telling me about how your student built a, a gas 
um, warning from World War I device. Like, so there's authentic context. That's my bottom line. Okay, so from fake to real, what's the product or performance students are doing? What are they creating or doing to show they've learned? So I'm arguing on the far left, the fake, like a test. Test is what schools make us do. Once you're out of school, uh, you know, you may take an occasional test for your driver's test, but for the most part, testing isn't what we do. Uh, tests are gatekeepers to higher education, but they tend not to be what we do in life. As I move along, and it is a continuum, I move to more, but these are things that are authentic in nature. By the way, essay writing can be an authentic task. In, in academia, we, we write. So writing in various forms could be real depending on the context. But you'll notice my, my other axes, the vertical axes, but who's the purpose or audience? And I think this one often gets forgotten about, that we can have really interesting tasks, but the only people who see that task is the teacher. Kids bring it in, we mark it, we send it home. It doesn't get beyond the classroom. What can I do to bump it up? So I just wanna give a couple of, of very quick examples of, of what I mean by this. So um, something in, I mentioned tests. See, tests have neither an authentic audience nor an authentic purpose. They, they haven't, you know, we, there are accountability issues and so on. I could bump that up by having a, a history fair. I could have a science fair. I now have an audience. I have people coming in to see the work but I may not have an authentic task. So if kids are simply gathering information on an event or a character and sticking it on a three panel display, they're still doing a, a, a task that's very school oriented, but doesn't have an authentic connection. So we've got an audience, but not the task. In the bottom right, I might have an authentic task, but nobody sees the task. So I don't have an audience. What I want to do is push it into that blue area. I would argue, for example, that School of Rock is a great example, not of great teaching necessarily, but boy, those kids had an authentic purpose, an authentic audience. Like they, they were playing in the blue. I want to show you in a, in, a, in a history context, assessments that inspire and kind of connect it to that, to what I was just mentioning. My last field trip before I left the classroom a number of years ago, I was teaching ancient history in an Ontario high, grade 11 ancient course. And I told my kids the first week, that a month from now, we're going to the beach to build sandcastles. And you have to decide, you have to select an ancient site that's an important representation of that culture, that civilization. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. The girls you see on the left, they're starting, the, they're digging out what will become Epidaurus, the Greek theater. The bottom right is a Roman bath complex. Up top, you see in the background, uh, an Aztec pyramid emerging. The kids at the front are starting to build what will become a, a very large, probably six feet long, three feet high a Sphinx from ancient Egypt. The kids arrived at 10 o'clock. They had from 10 until two o'clock. By, by two o'clock, the beach was covered in, in huge sculptures of, of ancient sites. Now, you might be wondering, uh, yeah, but that's sand sculpting is not a curricular outcome. And I'd say, you're absolutely right. I couldn't care less how good you are as a sand sculptor from a curricular lens. Remember, I told you this was the first week. I wanted kids to work on how to ask good questions, how to find reliable sources, how to compile a useful set of notes, both, both visuals and, and content, and how to collaborate with others to pull something off that was substantial. That was my learning goal. By the way, the next unit, we're going to build off that, the ability to ask questions, gather evidence, make uh, useful notes, and we're going to turn it into a movie review. We're building towards writing a, a research paper. Where's the authentic part? At two o'clock, I had contacted media, CTV News showed up, local newspapers showed up. My kids knew the media was coming in at two o'clock and that trophies were going to be given out. They weren't worried about their mark. They wanted to have impressive things because there was an outside audience. So what I want you to think about is, you know, what are tasks we can use? And when you have that really cool task, could you bump it up by inviting in uh, I used to have students who have to create a display on history. And in many of our provinces, we have a very spiraling curriculum where you know the, the similar content might be covered in elementary school and covered again in high school. But what if your high school students have to create uh, informative display boards that they go to your feeder school and actually put up? They're meant to help the younger kids learn. So that's your audience. You have to think about what's appropriate, what content, what writing level. But don't put up the display board in my classroom where I mark it and then you take it down. Get it out there somewhere. Uh, 
another piece in terms of inspiring, like how do we make how do we make learning relevant? How, how do we get kids to see value? Uh, Vanessa mentioned that she teaches civics, and I'm sure many several of you here teach a civics course. Uh, you know, it struck me. You know, what if like getting kids who don't have the right to vote yet, have never voted, have probably grown up in homes where their parents make the rules and come to school, rules are often are set for them. How do I make democracy tangible? How do I make it, how do I make it real and matter? And I got thinking, you know, what if what if we connected it to the probable settlement of Mars? Because a lot of the stuff you read around settling Mars is around the science. How will how will use how science will get us there? And it struck me, what if we ask kids, okay, if, if you've seen the movie, The Martian, you know, my, one of my favorite lines is when Matt Damon realizes he's stuck there and he says, well, I'm going to have to science the blank out of this. And I thought, yeah. And if we ever do settle Mars, we're going to have to civics the crap out of it as well. What if my civics course were to be, as we learn about various forms of government, as we learn about various issues, I want you to compile um, advice for Elon Musk. If you manage to get Mars settled, what what government what should government look like? We have a chance to take a blank slate and take the best. You know, if you're in Alberta, you know, grade six, you look at the Iroquois Confederacy, you look at Athenian democracy, you look at our current democracy. What can we learn about what to avoid and what to use to build the best possible governance for Mars? You know, what if civics got kids thinking about you get to build a new form of governance? What would it be like? prepare a letter for Elon Musk. I want to give you one other piece to kind of anchor this. And this is something I've been playing with lately. By the way, I would love, if you don't mind, I shared a couple of thoughts I had on like, how do I create assessments that get kids excited? If any of you would be willing to, in the chat, just offer some assessments that if you've used that, that supports my notion that assessments can excite kids. Do you have some assessments you've used? that your kids have been pumped. They wanted to do them. They were excited to do them. They weren't, they weren't the torturous thing that, that we often see. So any, any others that we can just share, I think is, is fabulous. I wanted to offer um, you know, a quick thought around this notion of prospective thinking. And, and uh, it's something I've been playing with over the last, I don't know, year and a half. And if you're not familiar with the term, prospective thinking uh, means to, to be looking forward. So it's, when you are a prospective thinker, you are, are weighing uh, various scenarios and saying, you know, what can we learn? By the way, notice the connection I want to make by looking at the past and the data we have now, how can we better plan for the future? Okay. So getting kids uh, to think about what does the past have to teach us that might help us inform how we build a better future going forward. So Pat, the past, when kids say, why do I need to learn history? It's in the past anyway. Well, it, the lessons of history are not in the past. They're very much in the present. So prospective thinking, you can see it, it's around developing memories of the future. So memories of the future are saying, hmm, what do we know? And I'll give the best example we have right now. Had we paid attention, more closely to what history has to teach us about the response to the Spanish flu or other pandemics. Could have we been better prepared for this pandemic? Could have we responded faster? Could we have been in a better place? I would argue, you know, as we start to learn that selling off the pharmaceutical companies controlled by Canadians, and we see, wow, that wasn't such a good idea. If we learn from that, maybe we'll be in a better spot. So I wanted you just to, you know, to think about the possibilities of adding a prospective twist into your assessments where kids, and I'll give you a quick example. Here's a critical thinking question. Uh, was Alexander the Great an effective leader? That's a critical thinking question. Well, I'd have to have criteria for an effective thinker. I would apply evidence from Alexander the Great's career to make a decision. But a prospective question would be, what can we learn from Alexander the Great that can help inform us about the kind of leaders we need to help lead us? What mistakes did he make? What did he get right? How can characters from the past help us to think about the future? And I think that way we can say to kids, of course our subjects are important for teaching the future because they, they help you plan for the future. Anyway, uh, concerning prospective thinking, from what I've just said to you, I hope you see 
they allow us to teach for transfer. They allow us to get kids to look conceptually. So going down to that bottom piece, they're around conceptual understanding of what makes effective leadership, their critical thinking, where they're applying those best lessons. They allow for creative connections, meaning making and agency. So anyway, I want you to consider, ponder that if, if you would. Now, here's what I want to do for, for just a little bit with you. If we want to assess for thinking and, and interesting to me, Whenever I work with schools around critical thinking, generally about the third session in, I get the question, this is really good stuff. I'm really enjoying this, but how do I assess it? It, it always becomes the question, you know, once we wrap our head around, what does it mean to think critically? How would we frame that question? And that reminds us that, you know, it's always easier to assess for correctness than it is to assess for soundness. Right. So when you're assessing for thinking, I'm not that interested in whether you have the correct answer. I am interested in the soundness of your answer. So by the way, you'll notice it's not any answer goes. It's not there are no right or wrong answers. Well, yeah, they're not right or wrong, but there are weak and sound. And in my class, when I'm assessing for thinking, I'm assessing for the soundness of your answer. Now, to get there, I'm going to try in the you know, 35 minutes ish that we have. I'm going to uh, try to touch on five things I think that can help us put our focus on assessing for soundness in ways that are manageable for teachers, powerful for kids, um, and, and can make our, our workload um, better and kids more inspired. So this we call a cascade. Some of you may have worked with me in the past and seen this idea of planning around a cascade. You'll notice, uh, if I could just point out a few pieces that, that frame this, we start with an overarching question. By the way, this could be this, in this case, this is a course long cascade. It might be a unit long cascade. It could be even shorter. But in this one, grade 10, a few years ago, we passed our 150th birthday. And the question we asked, what should we celebrate and what should we commemorate? Okay, so the big question, that question we called a through line question. That question is going to run through this entire course. What should be celebrated and what should be commemorated? And now we use a value line. So if I set up, let's say I'm doing the, the Ontario course, 1914 to the present. On a value line, if you can picture a timeline, but it's but it, instead of it just being everything's on the line, you've got above and below the line, okay? And above the line, these are events that should be commemorated. And way above the line, at a, say a plus two on a scale, these are moments of great pride. Uh, we should have fireworks, holidays, like this is a major deal. Plus one, this was a positive event for Canada. Not a great, but it was good. Minus one, this was an unfortunate, this, this, is, this is not something to celebrate. Minus two, this deserves an apology. This should definitely be commemorated. We ask kids throughout the course, you can decide how you want to share it. So use the media of your choice, but I want you to capture the highlights and lowlights of our history. You'll notice we then said, okay, to make this manageable, we came up with four lines of inquiry reflecting the four units. Now, depending on the province, the course you're doing, you would change this. But focus inquiry one in Ontario might be, were the costs of war and the benefits of prosperity shared equally? As we look at both World War I and the 1920s, where people all, you know, were we either all contributing to the war effort, were the, were the hardships shared, when the prosperity came back, was it shared? Okay. When we move into inquiry two, did we Canada handle the adversity of the depressions? Have to unpack that. You know, did we make sure everyone was supported? Did some do better than others? We can unpack what that means. Did Canada provide a model for the world in the post-war years? Did, did we have the model for the world to follow or should they avoid our examples? And then our last unit, we might look at, has Canada entered the 21st century as a world leader or a disappointment? When do you look at that? At those? Anyway, kids, each unit, they're pulling out another two or three pieces that they add into their highlights and lowlights. So you, what I'm hoping you see, there's a through line question. There's a through line challenge from an assessment lens. They're building that rich piece at the end, but in an ongoing iterative way, they can 
make mistakes and show a couple of others. I'd um, love to see you know, any thoughts or questions you might have. Does that, does that make sense? Does it resonate? Uh, does that kind of use of a through line question and a through line challenge? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm claiming that uh, I think that there's value in this from a um, depth of learning for kids, from a manageable learning or teaching from teachers. I just want to pause there and just to see if there's any thoughts on uh, questions or thoughts before I move to my next example. Yeah, I'll, I mean, feel free to post. I just, I'm always conscious of time. Here's another sample of, of again, a course long one that I might use in a, you know, world history, grade 11 or grade 12 course. What are the most important lessons we can learn from the past to help us create a sustainable and prosperous future? That's that prospective twist that I talked about. So kids would have to think about what makes an important lesson. And as we work through the course, I'm going to ask you to, by the way, notice I've put write an essay. I've got variations of this where kids create a museum display. You can do a variety of things. But as we work through the course, I want you to identify the five most important lessons. Chances are you're going to encounter 10 or 12 lessons that could be learned, but I want you to focus on the five most important. And again, you will see, and I won't go through all of them, but we start looking at, you know, in a unit, well, let's look at what we can learn about how past civilizations interacted with the natural environment and what lesson emerges from there. When we look at, you know, how do we live in harmony? So peace and conflict, what can we learn from the past? Keeping in mind what I'm learning from the past very well might be the mistakes that were made in the past that we want to avoid, or they might be what can inspire. Garfield, can Your I? Your voice is disappearing. Yes. Okay. So again, Love to see any, any Garfield, you're still having some problems with your voice. Can have you... thoughts, um, but that I yes. Okay, so tell me, <laughs> um, yes. Um, can you back up just a, a few sentences? No, not not. Can slide. you hear me now? Yes, we're good now. Let me know. Okay, so I'm uh, sorry, just give me one second. I'm changing locations in the house. Is this sounding better? How are we doing now? We can hear you. So good. Okay, well, we'll try this. Hopefully this is a better location. Um, okay, so um, I was saying uh, in this one, uh, I'll back up a little bit, but so sorry if I repeat. This one, I might have kids write an essay. I might have kids do a museum display. There's lots of things I can do. And the lessons that they tease out of history might be um, mistakes that were made and how can we learn from that and avoid that. It might be what inspiration uh, your technology is uh, skipping out again. So maybe just take a pause and I'm going but to- again, we have that through. Garfield, I'm going to send you, Garfield, I'm going to send you a phone number. Garfield, can I hear you? Garfield, can you hear us? I am just messaging him a phone number. Yes, I see that call in Chat. instead, but I'm not sure if he will get it. Yeah. So Garfield, Garfield, if you can hear me, my name is Kalinda. I'm one of the technical uh, help on this call. I've just sent you a, a message in the chat okay. with a phone number, a meeting yes. ID and a passcode. If you yeah, want to use I your you. phone to yeah. call in, then we might be able to hear you a little bit better. The phone number should be in the chat. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? You are better now, yes. Okay, hopefully this uh, sustains. Um, what I was saying, someone had asked me about rafts, and I started putting that in the chat, and then it shut down on me. 
So, sorry, just give me one moment. So RAF stands for uh, Role Audience Format Topic and Strong Verb or Message. So I'll give you an example. Um, in the example you see here, I'd be asking, by the way, the key for the, from a critical thinking lens is going to be the strong verb or message. So if I were taking a, a character from the past and they were in using rafts, the right, so you'll notice I asked, write a letter. So the format is a letter. The role is a character from the past. You select the character. The audience is someone in the present. The topic students would choose. I want to talk to you about the dangers of too much power concentrated in the hands of, of an individual. The strong message, notice I said too much power. So the key in rafts, what's the message you're trying to send? What are you trying to convince? Are you trying to warn? Are you praising? Are you criticizing? And so the kids have to choose language that matches the intent. So rafts is a way to get kids to think about in, in the role of writing to a particular audience, using a particular format, could be a political cartoon, could be a diary entry, and so on. What are you writing about? And what's the intent? What's your purpose? By the way, I noticed John said in the context of historical inquiry, uh, I'll do this very quickly because it's not really part of today. Imagine using rafts in reverse and using it to have students examine historical documents. So they use rafts to ask questions. Who created this document? What role was the person in who created this document? Who were they creating this for? Was this a letter that was being written um, by this person to uh, an elected official? Was it a family member? Uh, was it the general public? So who wrote it? To whom were they intending it? What's the format? And what does that tell me? If it's a personal letter, a formal letter, a political cartoon, how does the format inform how I read this? Um, What's the topic and what's the strong verb or message? Okay, sorry, I'm just wanna, I'm just um, Yeah, John, I, I would agree. I think that's a good fit. Um, I don't know, Paul, in response, I'm just thinking for a moment uh, how far we'll get to the Ontario model um, of, Paul, do you mind just taking a minute, uh, if you don't mind, and, and explaining to the group, um, just unpacking a little bit about why it feels to you that the Ontario inquiry model is mechanistic? And by the way, good to see you, Paul. I haven't seen you, Garfield. Uh, I've done uh, some a review of all the curricula in uh, social studies in Ontario, in conjunction with a larger project I'm working on uh, across the country. And uh, one thing that jumped out at me is every single curriculum document has the inquiry model at the outset, and it's presented as if it's the models into which everything should be poured, and um, I'm just, um, I'm very critical these days of uh, learnification and um, the, what it's done to creative thinking. And I, I do wonder if um, imposing or insisting that teachers use the inquiry model as constructed and presented in those curriculum documents might inhibit critical thinking. Well, I would, um... And I'm going to be short this because Paul, this may be something we want to follow up and have a good conversation around. Um, I'm going to say to you, I, I think it depends on how we're defining an inquiry. I think uh, I, I see inquiry models as you know basically um, retrieving information to answer a question. Uh, I, if we frame it as a, a critical inquiry model, uh, I, I think it depends on how how mechanistic we make it. I'm not sure inquiry by its nature has to do that. Um, it'd be an interesting question, I wonder, for teachers who are with us. I, I want to, just for time, if it's okay, I'm going to keep going, but I'd love teachers. Uh, Paul's raised an interesting question. If anyone would like to, you know, uh, when you think about in Ontario or other provinces, uh, in the inquiry model, how, um, how do you think it's impacting? And Paul, you've raised the issue of creativity. 
that it may inhibit creativity. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, just before I move on, Paul, would you mind just, you know, what's the, what's the concern you have between inquiry and creativity? Spontaneity, which to me is what makes history teaching so exciting. In other words, um, using the same method, whatever it is, whether it be the inquiry method or whether it be Socratic teaching to the exclusion of others, I think really does, uh, you know, it certainly impacts students, but it also um, in some ways narrows your repertoire as a history teacher. Okay, interesting. So I'm hearing in this, so how, uh, if we are adopting an inquiry model, is it an exclusive model or is there room for those other pieces so um now i'm going to move um i'm going to move along if that's okay just because i i need to cover some pieces and, but paul you've left me thinking about uh, this is good thank you uh, the second piece is to think about how do we create an iterative learning opportunity where uh, students are allowed to test ideas out, revisit them as they learn, change their mind over time. So I wanted to show you in this model, and I'm linking this to assessment, that assessment should seamlessly weave into uh, instruction. And uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, my wife and I wrote an article on what basically we posit as the double helix of learning where assessment, that, that we avoid this, uh, approach to learning where we teach, 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 pause and assess, and then we teach some more and then we pause and assess. And that instead assessment is seamlessly woven in on, on a daily basis to support student learning. And I, I wanted to show you some tools for that. And one of the ones, one of the tools, we call them learning launches. Uh, and I'm distinguishing this from a hook. Um, I find hooks are often used to get students attention, get initial, and then that, that question gets forgotten about, gets lost. A learning launch is, is a, spot, a place for kids to start their learning, to initiate some thinking, and then to revisit it. And I want to show you very quickly, and not all of these are history examples, but I'm sure you can connect them to that. This is the one that was asked in a grade, I think grade seven science class. And the question, they were learning about organ systems in the human body. And they began by asking, is Groot, if you know Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, who's this kind of walking, talking tree, is Groot more plant or animal? And the kids had to decide, by the way, you notice what we're trying to avoid is binary responses. So it's not, is he a plant or is he an animal? But where would you put it? And it kind of goes to the comment made earlier uh, that, that Colleen uh, added here you know, about the, the, to what extent. So kids start to, you know, well, I think he's a lot more animal than plant, or I think he's somewhat more. And we have this, this uh, you know, kids can kind of lean this way or lean that. And as they learn, they're invited to come back and say, have you changed your mind? What does the new evidence suggest to you? I'm gonna quickly show you a variety of launches. I'd love it if any of you in the chat might uh, post, like could you imagine in a history class, in a social science class, where you might use it, we call this a dashboard. Any use of a dashboard where you can see students being invited to take a position, I'm talking the first 10 minutes of a unit, and as they learn, revisit it. By the way, I've used this as an example in World War I. You know, if we were to uh, attribute you know, the cause of World War I, primarily Britain and her allies, more Britain and her allies than Germany, more Germany, most of Germany, where would you be? By the way, if kids don't know, leave it in the middle. A few days from now, I'll ask you again. So it creates this iterative approach. Uh, okay. Is, Napoleon more villain or hero? By the way, notice the key to me there is more hero or villain. He may have elements of both. Given what you think you know about Napoleon right off the bat, note the diagnostic. When I ask this right off the bat, I can get kids saying, well, at this point, given what I know, I'm leaning this way. Okay, what if you learn this? By the way, I want you to notice how this launch can fit in with the previous launch using a confidence meter. Getting students asked, so if I asked you this question, how confident are you in your response? So is violence an acceptable solution to Canada's peacekeeping? So take a position. Now, are you like 90% confident in that response? Are you 60%, 20%? What, what, would you, what might you hear that would move you along to be more confident? What might shake your confidence in your response? 
I saw this used with the school I work with in Warsaw, and it was fascinating to watch. It were grade 10 students watching them take a position, then they would learn, they would read, they'd discuss, and then they'd physically shift on the line. At one point, the teacher folded the line. So the kids were saying, no, I'm 90% sure of my position. We're talking to the kids who are less sure. And then let's see what impact that has. But it gets kids to start thinking about their position. And then, by the way, here's another similar idea. She's using a continuum. But instead of it being, you know, again, binary in, in, in a sense, where would you stand? Where do you draw the? So this one's where do you draw the line? At what point do we have an obligation to take action? So if I were looking at an issue like bullying, at what point does teasing between, between friends cross a line and become bullying? At what point do we have an obligation to take action? So I could look at that question around violence. At what point do other countries have an obligation to step in? And you invite kids, as remember, as a learning launch, I'm asking this the first day, we begin looking at case studies, we begin exploring, having our discussions, watching a video, teacher lecture. Has that changed your mind at all? And what caused it to change? Using a ranking ladder. This was a grade three class in, in Los Angeles I was working with. Uh, but notice the question, which type of severe weather is most dangerous? The kids were voting based on what they thought they knew. It's fascinating to me that drought was at the bottom, uh, given that we were in Los Angeles. But to kids, it just meant, well, it's another sunny day in California. As they learned, watched a video, you know, teacher-led discussion, as they learned more and more, each day the teacher would say, do you still think you, you want to say that? And the kids would put their hands up. Well, I'd like to change my vote now. Okay, explain why. It was just lovely to see every day the children engaging in weighing the new evidence. This is one that was asked uh, in a grade 11 class in Alberta. And the teacher came back and said to me, wow, we had such a good conversation with the kids. Who bears responsibility for World War II? And by the way, you'll notice in this one, it's a pie graph. So it's the degree. It's not you know, it, it's, it's not saying this, this is the group, but to what degree do each have a degree of culpability? And the students started at the beginning by saying, well, Germany clearly gets the biggest bite, but other people get this much. Okay, let's see if that changes. As the students learn, build their evidence, they debate, they discuss, they may decide to shrink one piece of the pie and expand another based on their new learning. So again, these are all learning launches and their intent is to get kids to start thinking right off the bat and to try to move them from, it's not about correct versus incorrect. It's about building a sound answer over time. It's okay. And by the way, if you have no idea, then take this pie graph and divide it into you know, seven equal parts. If that's your starting point, that's absolutely fine. As you learn, you'll need to defend and justify it. The next piece, and sorry for the rush through, but an hour can fly by pretty quickly. Getting students to use what we call a thought book. And the idea of a thought book is to give kids a place to play around with their responses in a way that is safe. It's their place. So the idea of a thought book is to try to create this continual interplay between what I knew, what I thought I knew, what new ideas I have. So I'll just show you a couple of examples. And I always tell students, you know, the idea of thought books is not new. Uh, I may have given it the label, but it's certainly not new. Darwin used a thought book. Uh, da Vinci is probably the most famous. Um, Isaac Newton. I, I just saw recently uh, Jim Morrison of the Doors had countless journals where he jotted down ideas. So the idea, it's a place just to park ideas, add new details, just giving kids that space. So what we're looking at is, can I give kids, by the way, connect this with a learning launch. So I give you a question and I say, in your, in your thought book, how would you support that position? I don't care if you draw me a picture, mind map it, but each day I teach a lesson. It's not a notebook. It's not where you keep your notes. It's how would you add to your response? And by the way, I want you to note from an assessment lens, thought books uh, do three key things. They are assessment as learning. Because I want you to note, the first assessor is always the student. Okay, it's not me. So each day that I teach a lesson, I assign a reading, whatever it might be. My students are the ones who are there being asked. So given what you just learned today, given new research you've done, given the lecture I've delivered, 
So given the learning that's taken place, would you change your response? What could you add to it? So in their thought book, they're playing with their response. They're building it over time. It's assessment for learning. And one of the things I want to say to you, I said at the beginning, you know, how do we engage in assessment that's good for kids, but manageable for teachers? So two quick things. Don't, if you decide to try out using thought books, don't mark them. Because if you mark them, you will kill their purpose. As soon as you begin marking the thought book, kids will start saying, have I done it right? Is this what you want? Okay. That's not its purpose. This is their place to think, to test ideas, park things. By the way, sometimes it's a separate document. Sometimes it's digital. Sometimes it's pictures you take with a camera. I saw one teacher, which I thought was brilliant. The thought for her was in the kid's notebook. So on the right-hand side, they'd put the date, the title, the notes they would take from a lesson or from a reading. So that would be the traditional. That's what I study from for a test and so on. That's on the right. The left side was the thought book, right? So on the left-hand side, the kids are jotting down their ideas, their parking ideas. And when they go to prepare their response, right? Then we have this building of a response or idea. As the so I'm saying you don't mark it. And secondly, don't drag it home. The most powerful use, um, for students in terms of using an assessment or thought book is just as kids are engaged in conversations, as they're working on whatever in class, move around, look at eight or 10 documents of, of thought books, each class. Just say, can I have a look at your thought book? Thanks, I take a quick look. I see what ideas are emerging. I see what the gaps are. Okay. And then kids begin to, uh, you get a sense of, okay, where, what student needs extra help? Uh, which kid should I partner? Do I need to back up? I'm seeing a number of, of gaps with students. So this is assessment for learning in the moment, supporting students. And But then notice my last one. It's a powerful uh, tool for triangulating our assessment evidence. So I just said to you, don't mark a thought book. Okay? And I would never mark a thought book. However, it would inform judgments I have to make. Okay, so. I want us to think about, you know, when I'm using this, a student hands in an end product. So let's say it's a museum display they've created or whatever it might be. And the display, I showed you earlier, you know, sandcastle competition. The, the work they produce, the end product is, is not as good as I'd hoped, but the learning that's reflected in the thought book, the depth of understanding that's coming through their thought book is better than the quality of the work they handed in. A thought book allows me to say, you know, the product itself, you know, is maybe a B plus or a level three or whatever term you want to use. But the mark I'm going to give the student for their learning would be, you know, I'm giving them an A minus. So, so, uh, so watching the chat and trying to talk. Um, so it's triangulating our assessment evidence. What do I, what do I know about the learning through the thought book? What do I know from the end product? What is a reasonable grade for the student? I'm going to show you, uh, watching time, we got about 10 minutes, two uh, quick things um, as we look at from an assessment, um, assessing the quality of thinking. And I have to start by saying I'm generally not a fan of rubrics, so I, I should put that out there up front. Um, that I, I find rubrics, you know, writing level one, two, three, four, where you simply change one word from student shows considerable understanding, student shows some understanding, student shows limited understanding. I've, I've never seen a lot of value in that as a learning tool. So I, I, I want to be clear, uh, most rubrics, so most rubrics are written as scoring tools. Okay? Uh, I can tell you within the critical thinking consortium, virtually all of the rubrics we've ever written were intended to give teachers some guidance in terms of scoring the student work. They're not learning tools. And most rubrics I've seen are not, they're not learning tools. They're meant to help teachers score, they help to give us a more consistent basis of that scoring, but they aren't really uh, learning tools. So I started playing with an alternative, which we call a guide to success. And the guide to success, uh, by the way, the name comes from you know, uh, keeping in mind that well, all guidance is feedback, not all feedback is guidance. 
Okay? So there are lots of times when I'm sure all of you in university had papers given back that had comments on them. There was feedback on your work, but that feedback wasn't really intended to help you do better. It was meant to justify the grade, you know, why you got a B plus and not an A. Guidance is genuinely helpful and timely. So I want to show you this idea of a guide to success that has a different look and, and intent than a traditional rubric. So th this is one that was constructed with a grade 11 teacher. It's one of, of five pages of different foci on writing a critical analysis essay. You'll notice in the left-hand column, the left-hand column, what do you need to do to complete the task? It's very intentional that the left-hand column, uh, in the left-hand column, there's no qualitative language. So this is just reminding the student, you must have a thesis. Your thesis statement must address all parts of the prompt. I expect a minimum of three, but not more than five arguments. If you have fewer than three, I'm going to hand it back and ask you to add an argument. If you have more than five, I'm going to ask you to cut one out. This is what you need to do. I'm being clear and upfront. Now, the second column is excellence. If you're doing well, if you're nailing this, this is what I'm looking for. So in the you would identify this is what we're shooting for. This is what it looks like when you get it right. Okay. So then we start to identify. You'll notice we don't bother writing the second column three more times. We don't change it. You know, it's uh, somewhat insightful. It's not very insightful. We state it once. And then a key shift is we then invite the student. This is why it's meant it's iterative. It's supporting earlier pieces. This is meant to say now to the student, so when you come to me for guidance, I want you to tell me what you're feeling good about, what's working well for you. I want you to tell me where you think you need to work, what I want you to target so I can give you some guidance. And maybe you want to, you know, I think I'm feeling pretty good about a lot of my work right now, but I'd love to take it to the next step. What might that be? And then the teacher responds to the student. So the, the shift here is instead of students handing their work in, and then holding their breath and waiting to see if the teacher liked their work, we're flipping this to say, no, the student is coming to the teacher. By the way, this can also be peer. So maybe it's self and peer. This is where I'm feeling good about. This is where I'd like some help. If I have time, here's what I'd like to, where I'd like to go further. And then the student writes back. So I wanted to show you this as, as an alternative. Um, by the way, here's one for a museum exhibit, say in grade nine or 10. Uh, you can see you, you must uh, sketch three prototypes, you must contribute one finished artifact, you must ensure that the artifact adds something new, you must provide a description, but you'll notice when we move to the second column, so I'll just, uh, for example, jump down, if you forgot your descriptions, please add them. If you have descriptions, are they accurate, concise, and, con and con only have useful information? There's not, nothing extra that you didn't need there. Um, did you explain the lesson learned? Is that lesson clearly explained and profound? And then we would talk with students through it. My last piece, and I actually might finish this on time, um, is looking at thinking organizers. And, and I wanna be clear, when I talk about a thinking organizer, this is meant to connect. Remember at the core of all critical thinking is students are being invited to make uh, thoughtful or reasoned decisions in light of evidence and criteria. So a thinking organizer tries to pull that together. So I'll give you an example. Here's, here are the key elements of any thinking organizer. They don't have to look like this. This is just showing you an example of, of what it might look like. So there's, it's always framed around a critical inquiry question. So some kind of provocative question that puts focus and interest. It's not a retrieval question. It's a judgment students are being asked to make. There's always a set of criteria to guide students in making that decision. There's a place for students to record evidence. And notice that evidence is not just being recorded in a linear way, it's being organized around the criteria. And in this case, it's set up to say, is the evidence showing that the criteria is or is not met? And any thinking organizer then has a place for students to reflect on the degree to, re to respond to that question, not to make that judgment. So there's a question students have thought about or been presented a set of criteria a place to record evidence in light of criteria and a place to weigh evidence to reach a reasoned conclusion. So that's, those are the key elements 
Uh, there are multiple forms that, that this could take, but you know, here's an example. Was Henry VIII the ideal Renaissance man? But what do we mean by the ideal Renaissance? What criteria you can use? These are drawn from uh, Castiglione's book of the courtier, but you, know, you build the criteria with kids, they begin to learn about, they start gathering their evidence, they make a judgment. It might be framed in this way. If I wanted you to select interesting artifacts, how do I decide what artifacts to retain? I've got 10 artifacts, but room for five in my museum display. How do I decide which ones are most useful? How serious of a threat is climate change? So here you see integrating the launch, the dashboard, with a set of criteria. As students learn, they start gathering, sorting, making a decision, they gather some more, maybe that causes them to shift their position a little bit. Okay. So they're thinking through as they gather evidence. Uh, you might use a fishbowl as a graphic organizer. The head of the fish being the provocation, the tail of the fish, what's the judgment they're making? What's the criteria they're gathering? What's the evidence? The bones of the fish are the evidence. When I weigh that evidence in light of the criteria, what decision would I make? So notice all of these structures have the same features, a question students are gonna grapple with, some criteria that will guide them in their thinking, a place to record the evidence, look at that criteria in light of, and make a judgment. And last one, uh, using a thinking map. So again, like the fishbone, there's a provocation that drives the, the learning, a set of criteria that students use to organize their thinking, when evidence is gathered or presented to them, they decide which criteria does it best match. They look at that evidence in light of that criteria, helping them to, to make a decision or a judgment. So those are um, what I was proposing today when we we're looking to, to frame uh, assessments so that we're assessing the quality of thinking uh, rather than uh, assessing for uh, retrieval of information. These are, are you know, five things I'm suggesting that might be helpful is, is organizing the learning through a cascade so it leads to rich, sustained learning over time. The, the use of learning launches to invite students in and invite them to revisit in an iterative way, to use a thought book as a place, a safe place into the muck about, test ideas, uh, test out answers, provide a guide to success so there's ongoing reflection by the student on, am I doing what is required? Am I doing it well? What else could I do? And then finally, um, using a thinking organizer of some kind to help students uh, make their decisions or judgments. So um, in the end, uh, I started talking about you know, trying to cultivate learner agency. Uh, the visual I presented had uh, some, some of the guiding principles. I want to inspire kids. I want to make sure my assessments, uh, kids can see themselves reflected in them or interest in them. I, I want to build their capacity. The actions, I want to engage with authentic learning. I want to use a prospective approach. I want kids to embrace setbacks as opportunities to learn. You can see a variety of things. And my final column is what I was presenting to you. These are the actual practices. Like what can I do in my class that puts it operationalizes the actions that get at the principles. Okay, um, with one minute left to go, uh, I just put there my my email is there, um, uh, Twitter is there. Um, hour goes by quickly, but if you want to follow up, if there's anything I can share with you, many of the examples were Word documents. Happy to to send them out. Um, anything that I can do. And, and I have a couple of minutes if there are questions, but uh, I know things are tight. I have another session coming up, but thank you so much. And sorry for the occasional technical glitches, but I think we, we got through it. And, and thanks for the active uh, chatting going on and, and uh, provocative questions that we're playing out there. I'll turn things back to you, Vanessa, at uh, 12. Thank you so much, uh, Garfield. I'm feeling exceptionally inspired right now, but also validated because there are some of those techniques that I'm also using. Um, so on behalf of OHASTA and SANC and ACS, um, I would like to thank you for sharing your information today. Um, the videos I believe are going to be uh, posted as well on the OHASTA website. Um, and I believe um, they should be accessible possibly from SANC as well. Uh, 
have a great day, everyone. And I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the presentations and that uh, Monday morning uh, looks sunny for all of you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Garfield. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Would you be able to send us some uh, links so we can actually print uh, some of the fish bones and other? Do you have the resources? Um, drop me an email and I can send them back to you I as Word documents you can, if that's okay. Yes, I will just send you Aura Gold. Yeah. Great. Perfield, uh, it's been a while. You got a minute? Yeah. Hey, Paul. Garfield, I just send you aura gold at hotmail.com. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Could we uh, bye -bye. find five minutes, not now, because you're busy? Uh, I put a bunch of questions up there. I'm serious yep. about having a discussion with you about what are the answers to those questions, particularly in the current environment where you go to a yeah, workshop no. and somebody makes a declaratory statement and this is the way the world works. And our job is to get to busy um, making this happen and bringing this down and bringing this forward. Uh, I don't really find that's conducive to critical thinking. I, I would agree, Paul. I, I'm not sure if you're saying I did that and maybe I did. Oh, I'm not even, it has I, nothing to do with you. I'm talking about okay. the whole question. I sort of the, I'm talking, it's a theoretical question I'm asking yeah. about the nature of critical thinking and how the environment um, limits the scope of what you can do. Like we had a session yesterday which said, what is a question you can ask? That you can ask. Yeah. Hmm. Like what's a, you know, the, well, you know, the context we're in. So yeah. we've been through a lot over 40 years. There were contexts where you never had a doubt that you could raise any question you wanted. <laughs> but now, well, you know, yeah, you know, if I can give you a quick example, I often I've encountered people over time who have said, you know, very kindly, I really like the work you're doing and I like the critical thinking work. But then they'll cite Paul of Prayer and they'll say, but critical thinking. You know, Paula Freire would say it has to lead to social action or it's not really critical thinking, blah, blah, blah. And, and the response I, I give is, but I mean, I like Paula Freire's work, but he starts from the presumption exists. So there, there's, there's a danger in, you know, if you tell me this is the problem and we have to address it, you're presuming that I accept that that problem exists. So we need to back that up a step and invite students into you know, weighing whether there's a, because I think there's a danger. I, I hear what you're saying is I think there's a danger of indoctrination. And um, I had a student of mine the other day, she said, and I applaud her. She said, you know, I want to be an activist educator. And I said, I think that's great. I just want to know how you're going to do it without imposing your values. How are you going to balance that with a critically thoughtful class? Right. And she said, I really don't know yet. I'm trying to figure that out. But I think there are, I mean, I'm glad she wants to be activist. I'm just nervous that there's a set of, there's a solution that is her solution that she wants them to adopt. Yeah, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I've been spending a lot of time in the international educational milieu where there's a lot wider range of acceptable discussion topics. I've been very much influenced by, have you ever looked at the great um, uh, issues um, process in Britain? like in the high schools? The great no, I haven't, no. <laughs> no one is afraid. To, every, they, uh, their microaggressions, <laughs> they don't worry about microaggressions. <laughs> so I was just, I was at a couple of their sessions and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I thought this would not be possible. And I think it's just that they're <laughs> used to wide open debates on fundamental issues and everything is it's quite as constrained within certain boundaries, I guess. Or maybe people are just a little more resilient. They kind of are prepared to air it out a bit more. Well, where, where are you physically located these days? Halifax. I'm an adjunct professor. Okay, of you are still in the... I'm an adjunct professor. Of yeah, and I know you were at, at an independent school there for a number of years. 
Yes. Right in in Halifax. But that was um, I've been out of there for right after you left uh, Ontario. You went to yeah. Lower Canada College. Hall in Garfield. Right. I'm going to be leaving. Uh, anyway, I have to get ready for the next. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. an next. There's yeah. another. I was just going to say, Paul. Let's. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I'm yeah. going to jump onto that. So I'm Paul, sorry. let's see if we can find a time we can do a Zoom call or or, or right. something and have more time we'll to chat. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Good, sorry good to see that. you. All right. Okay. Bye -bye. No problem. Thanks. Bye bye.